Good morning. Hi, my name is Joanna Nelson, and I am a financial development specialist with the New Mexico Economic Development Department. And I want to thank you very much for um, attending our, our webinar today. We're really excited about the, the topic and, and our presenter today. Um, this webinar is a part of a series that the Economic Development Department, uh, the finance team, we have um, created, and, and we've been doing it about two years, but initially we polled um, Council of Governments, local governments, and economic development organizations to see what topics um, were relevant to them, what topics were, were interesting, um, what topics they wanted to know more about. And um, bonding, <clears throat> bond financing, was one of those topics. So um, we're, we're really excited to, to address the, the basics today and thrilled that our presenter can, can help out um, address those issues. And um, just to point out, we will be recording this um, presentation. We'll upload it to our uh, uh, YouTube channel, and then we will make a PDF and we'll send it out to all of the the registered participants, so you'll have access to that um, as well. And if you do have questions, we'll take questions at the end, so feel free to, as we go along, um, type your questions in, in the questions box in the right hand of your screen, and we'll get to those. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about um, the finance team and our services. If you don't already know, hopefully you're familiar with, with our division. But um, we provide basic finance services. Um, we are a really small team, but we are able to, to look at financial packaging. We can um, review financial statements, financial analysis. We can provide incentive analysis if, if you have companies that are interested in taking advantage of, of some of the tax incentives and um, some of the financing programs that we offer. We can provide an analysis and an estimated dollar value um, to their project. And then we do a lot of connecting the dots. So when you do have businesses that are interested in expanding, in, in relocating to your area, um, we can connect them to appropriate financial programs and resources. So feel free to reach out. Um, we're, we're here, we're, we're willing to help. And then just to go over our programs quickly, um, we've had some new ones uh, come up recently, but um, we administer the Local Economic Development Act, the LIDA Fund. We also manage Fund It, which is um, also a part of, of we, within Fund It, we do a webinar series as well, but it's part of providing education and, and connecting communities to financial resources when they have questions about how do I pay for this, where, where can I find financial opportunities. Um, we, administer, we help facilitate the New Markets Tax Credit Program, um, our newest program, the New Mexico Credit Enhancement Program, we're really excited about. This is, this is live and, and we're enrolling projects and um, lenders, but we can cover collateral shortfalls within a commercial loan project. So if you have a company or a business that is trying to get a business loan, but they have a shortfall in collateral, we can purchase a CD in that, that bank to cover collateral shortfall. We also have the Rural Efficient Business Program that we administer. Um, this is a program we're working on in, relation, in, in, uh, in partnership with the New Mexico Energy Minerals Natural Resource Department. So we've, we've gone um, to three different parts of the state. We have three more. We'll be in Clovis um, at the beginning of August. And we'll conduct a workshop to um, help businesses reduce their energy consumption connect them with financial resources as well if they're interested in renewable energy technologies. And then we're also helping to facilitate questions and issues in regard to the opportunity zones. 
So that's a, an overview of, of what we do. And then as well, you um, have a New Mexico Economic Development Department regional rep in your area. So just want to point that out. Um, you can kind of see this smaller map that's available on our website. But we have six different reps. They're fantastic resources. If you don't know them, uh, contact them and get in touch. There, there are boots on the ground and can help connect you with the department, with different um, governmental entities. They're, they're there to help. And then as well, um, New Mexico Main Street is within our department too. And they do a lot of um, work with helping to facilitate um, financing questions and, and in regard to development projects. So um, these are live links. You can click those and go directly to those web pages. So without further ado, I want to introduce Toby Rittner. He's our presenter today. And he's the president and CEO of the Council of Development Finance Agencies, otherwise known as the CDFA. And this is a fantastic organization that's, that's national. He's, he's calling in today from Columbus, Ohio. And they're a wonderful resource for um, financing information, education, technical assistance. They, they are a pleasure to work with and have a wealth of experience and information. So we're really excited that um, he's, he's sharing his time and, and wisdom today. So without further ado, I want to introduce him and um, take it away, Toby. All right. Thanks, Joanna. This is great. Good morning, everybody. And um, I'm glad that uh, Joanna is so excited about bond finance at 9 o'clock in the morning because it's <laughs> my time. And I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that uh, we can find tons of enthusiasm for bond finance at 9 o'clock in the morning, but this is really good because I'm excited. It's a pleasure to be on with you all. Uh, congratulations for joining the webinar to talk about bond financing. It is not a uh, it's not an easy subject matter, so we'll spend the next hour or so going through the nuts and bolts. Um, also, want to thank New Mexico Economic Development for hosting me and for having us on here and for the kind words and and the invitation. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, my name is Toby Rittner. Obviously, I'm the president CEO of CDFA. I am calling in from Columbus, Ohio, where we're headquartered. Um, many people think we're in D.C., but we are actually uh, located in Ohio. We have a national footprint. I'll tell you briefly about the organization, and then we're going to jump into bond financing. Uh, given the density of this subject matter, uh, I'm going to go relatively quick, um, and I've got a couple disclaimers here that I'll speak to you about so that uh, you don't get uh, either too far behind or too far ahead and make sure that we just have this introductory discussion. Like like, I, like we've mentioned in the subject line, uh, this is a 101, and I, I would really call this like a, a 050 because uh, we're just going to scratch the surface just a bit. So um, let me make sure I have the control to change. There we go. Uh, just really quick, this is uh, my lawyers, and our lawyers make us do this. We do have a legal disclaimer. Just want to make sure you all understand that uh, we're not a registered municipal advisor. We're not providing advice, guidance, or recommendations on the issuance of municipal securities or municipal financial products. If you are interested in doing bond financing, it is uh, encouraged and also uh, required that you seek the advice of skilled legal, financial, or registered municipal advisors. Um, again, uh, you must uh, and you must engage counsel to participate in the use of any type of municipal security, like a bond. So, just my disclaimer. Um, really quickly about our organization, CDFA is a 32-year-old National Trade Association, I'm sorry, 36-year-old National Trade Association focused on education, advocacy, research, resources, and networking. We are a trade association of development finance interests, so many of you can or might be members of the organization. Uh, as an example, in your state, New Mexico Finance Authority is a member of ours, has been a member of CDFAs for many, many years, uh, even prior to me being here. One of our core strengths is that we do a lot of training in our training institute, courses on the fundamentals of finance, bonds, TIF, tax credits, revolving loan funds, PACE, EB-5, food, brownfields, rural, and all, all everything in between. Last week, we hosted our intro public-private partnership course and had 60 professionals from around the country participate in that, in that course online. We, we offer almost all of our courses online. But if you do like live training, we have something called summer school every year. This year, it's the first week of August in Pittsburgh. And we do five training courses in one week, and you can choose three of those. 
And those are all of our basic courses, like intro to TIF and tax credit and revolving loan funds and bonds. And so that's an opportunity to learn a little bit about a, a number of tools, but also to get um, get a sense of what is in the toolbox, as I'm going to describe here in just a bit. We also provide a lot of research. Looks like my slides kind of got screwed up in the transition, so sorry for some of the little technical things. Um, it looks like it shrunk the slides sideways a little bit. Uh, we do a lot of research, resources, and technical assistance. We provide advice to states and to local governments uh, related to uh, how they use their development finance tools. We provide research on uh, federal financing, bond volume cap, on how, how state and locales use their bond volume. We also provide technical assistance to clients like development authorities, universities. We work for the World Bank, and we have you know, two or three at any time contract with federal agencies to help them think about how development finance tools operate. One of our core products, if you will, that we love doing for communities is to help them with roadmaps to redevelopment or strategic financing uh, um, uh, plans. The idea being, you know you want to use these tools. You want to use bonds, TIF, tax credits. You want to start a revolving loan fund. You just don't know kind of which one to do first and the process. And we will do a plan for you and help you uh, with with your within your community to talk about how you put the toolbox in place, how you bring greater financial capacity to your community. And we do we only do about two or three of those a year because they're a lot of work, but um, that's something that we offer that I'd, I'd encourage you to consider if you're thinking about putting a more robust toolbox of financing programs in place. We are the largest um, organization in the world related to development finance. If you go onto our website, um, these are static images. Obviously, they're not live images. You can't click on them. But go to cfa.net and go to resources. You'll see all of the resources we have, like our online resource database, which has nearly 10,000 resources in it, all categorized by the type of tool that you might want to use. So if you keep hearing this term like EB-5 or industrial development bond, you can go in there, click on that term, and it'll show you all our resources. But if that's um, overwhelming, you can click on this section called Resource Centers. And in there, we have 17 different resource centers that we've developed. So if you want to learn everything there is to know about bond financing, you can go to our Bond Finance Resource Center, and it'll break down all the tools into discernible uh, subject matter. So what is an IDB? What is a 501c3 bond? What are exempt facility bonds? And it allows you to digest it in a more, um, in a more casual manner. We find that our resource centers are really popular, whether you're trying to learn about seed and venture capital or energy finance or food, ag, food and ag finance, you can go in there and learn about those. We also have two really good resources, our Federal Financing Clearinghouse and our State Financing Program Directory. And what we do is we spend uh, too much time, way too much time, finding out all of the programs that exist at the federal and state level. We put them in clearinghouses so that you can see what they look like and if you're trying to employ a tool from the EDA or EPA or the Department of Transportation, you can read an overview of how that program works and click on that. And same thing for your state. Um, Joanna just mentioned a handful of programs that I'm looking through quickly on my side. We need to update our database to make sure that we have those programs in there so that not only you can go to New Mexico's website, but you can also go to ours and find out what your state has and what uh, how it compares to other states. Here's just a look at a few of our um, resource centers as an example, bonds, revolving loan funds, tax increment finance, maps of how the tool work, where they're at, what some of the laws are, and you can go in there and just kind of get a sense of, of, of these tools. Sorry, there's a slight lag. Okay, we also do free newsletters. If you're interested in bonds after this, you can register for our bond finance update newsletter. It's once a month, it's not overwhelming. And we send you, you know, the 10 or 15 things that happened in the last 13 days. I'm sorry, last 30 days. We do that for TIF, tax credits, bonds, revolving loan funds, EB-5, brownfields. I'm forgetting a couple uh, tax credits. And then we have our, we do those once a month. And then if you want a little more um, diversity, we offer our development finance review weekly, which goes out every Thursday morning. And that covers what's going on in the in the grand scheme of development finance around the country. And our editor of this really works hard to capture everything from the previous seven days. Whether it's from your state or from other parts of the country, you can kind of see trends and what's happening in that. And then one that's not on here that I know you'd all be very interested in is our is our legislative and federal affairs update. And in that, we have all the notices of funding availability, 
RFPs for federal funding opportunities, and we publish that once a month, or more on demand as opportunities arise. One thing I wanted to mention to you all, and, and I'm kind of obligated to throw this one in because it's really important that you all see it. Sorry about the logos there on the bottom. Again, it got crunched. Um, we are funded by the US EPA to provide brownfield technical assistance. So if you have a brownfield in your community and would like someone to help you design a roadmap to redevelopment, give our team a call here. It's free. We'll send out experts uh, who are who are expert people who are experts in brownfield financing as well as bond TIF and tax credits. And we'll spend three or four days in your community helping you assess the potential for revitalizing and redeveloping your, um, your project site. We'll provide you a roadmap to redevelopment with our response teams and give you some sort of guidance on how to move forward with that. And that's completely free. So if you're interested, just give us a call or email us at CDFA and we'd be happy to get you in the queue for that free service. And we do it all and we just come out there and help you with your, uh, with your project. We are an advocacy organization. You can follow us online to learn more about how we advocate for federal uh, resources. One thing that Joanna mentioned was the Opportunity Zones program. Um, that program has really taken off and we have become the National Trade Association around that subject matter. Uh, we are launching webinars and training. We are working on an event in September where we're gonna invite folks out to DC to talk about how they're implementing strategies around Opportunity Zones. We have sort of taken on the trade association leadership role. And if you go to our website, you'll see a little pop-up right now, right where it says right now at CDFA. It won't be my picture. It'll be someone else's. And it'll say Opportunity Zones. And you can see our Opportunity Zones Resource Center. It's the largest resource center around. It has every document you can imagine from all over the country. And we encourage you to check it out to, to take advantage of that new tool. All right, let's get through this here. There's a slight lag, so sorry, everyone. Hey, we want you to join. We are a member organization. We hope you'll consider joining the organization and, and being part of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we can't do it without our member. We have members. We have over 500 member organizations all around the country that are members of CDFA, and we interact with nearly 31,000 professionals every single week. So if you're interested in membership, go to CDFA.net and look up membership, and we'd love for you to join. And, of course, follow us at CDFA Update. All right, let's talk about bond financing. So why is it, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about why finance is so important. I think you probably all know this a little bit from your previous webinars um, with, the, with the Economic Development Department. But when we think about development finance, it's an effort of a local community to support and encourage the expansion of public and private investment and in whether this is physical development, redevelopment or business and industry. And when we put our resources in, we contribute to projects or deals that cause those projects or deals to move forward in a manner that you know benefits the long-term health of the community. So there's a difference between funding and finance. And funding is an infusion of money to help fill a gap or potentially provide a subsidy where a project just simply cannot operate without that, uh, without that element. Finance is a way for you to reduce the cost of your borrowers so that they can access different types of capital to move their project forward. And so think about it like this. If you have a manufacturer who's thinking about expanding and has a $5 million capital need, you can either take that manufacturer to the bank and get him or her a 10% loan or a 12% loan or an 8% loan or whatever it is. And that's one way of financing them. But through our mechanisms and the ones we're going to talk about today and the ones that are so important in economic development, you could take them to the bond market and issue an IDB and maybe get them a five and a half or a six percent rate. So what is the capital cost on a six percent loan compared to an eight percent loan? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. And so we often get into this commentary where we talk about development finance or economic development is how do we fund it? Well, we're not trying to fund stuff. We're trying to finance stuff. We're trying to take good borrowers, take borrowers who need a little bit of help, and to get them into a situation where they're paying reasonable rates that allow them to move forward in a reasonable manner. It requires programs and solutions to the challenges in our local environment. Uh, we, as the economic developers, we can bridge this gap. We're able to go and talk to businesses and industry and developers and say, what are your capital needs and how can I use my financing toolbox to drive your capital needs? And the other thing about the difference between funding and finance is funding is very local. You get a pot of 
the money from HUD or from USDA, you really need to use it locally. With finance, you have the ability to be regional. You can go to NMFA, you can go to New Mexico Economic Development, you can go to your county or your township or your city, and you can figure out how to use a financing tool at any of those levels. Sometimes you may have multiple issuers of bonds. Maybe you are the issuer of bonds at the city, but you know what? You'd rather go through the state to have them issue bonds because their relative credit and uh, credit score is better than the city's. And that's one of the great things about finance is that it can be uh, collaborative. It doesn't have to be so localized like traditional economic development funding tends to be. So what does it include? We're gonna, we talk about all these terms, debt and equity, credits, liabilities, guarantees, collateral support, credit enhancement. Joanna mentioned their collateral support credit enhancement programs. I mean, that's exactly what it is. She mentioned those two words. I kind of I kind of smiled because I like to hear finance people talk about the different ways in which we can support uh, business and industry. So instead of Joanna just putting money into another component of a loan, she's providing collateral support. She's using the mechanisms of finance to get uh, a borrower uh, leverage lending, and that's great. Really what it comes down to is exactly what she talked about with the division or with the department is being proactive. How do you leverage these little resources that you have in your community to solve the needs of business and industry and developers and investors? And keep in mind, we're going to talk about bonds here, but the prerogative of those four groups are all very different. Businesses need to be able to grow. They need affordable capital. They need to be able to invest in themselves. They need workforce. Industry needs support. They need infrastructure. They need water. They need sewer. They need electricity. They need affordable, uh, affordable industrial land where they can grow and expand, and they need access to resources. Developers need one thing and one thing only, an acceptable return on investment. They're not going to do it just for fun. So if we can find a way to limp, to reduce their financing costs, they can get a higher return on, invest, on investment. And investors, you know, the investors, the, 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 the women and men and institutions who buy bonds, they simply want to know how they're going to get paid back and are they going to get paid back at the rate with which you are saying they will. So when we think about how we use these tools, particularly we talk about bonds, we want to make sure that we're thinking about the, the needs of, of industry and business investors and developers. And this is very similar to what I just mentioned, so I'll click through that really quick. So the term we're going to talk a little bit about today is a development finance agency. Those are the, the predominant members of CDFA, and there's, you know, 300 or 280 of those that are members of CDFA. Development finance agencies can be either public or quasi-public private authorities that support economic development through direct and indirect financing programs. DFAs have a unique authority under state and federal law to issue tax-exempt bonds, provide credit enhance, enhancements, and offer direct lending or a broad range of other access to capital financing mechanisms. They can be formed at the state, the county, the township, the borough, or the municipal level, and they often have the authority to provide development finance programs across multi-jurisdictional boundaries. Now, what does all that garbage mean? See if you're a DFA. See if your state law allows you to be an issuer of bonds. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I already know that it does in New Mexico because I already looked it up, and I'll give you some examples here. But a really good example is the New Mexico Finance Authority. They are a statewide development finance agency that is given the power and the laws to issue tax-exempt bonds. So the first lesson in this whole thing is you must have authority. Now in New Mexico, cities and cities have authority, uh, assuming uh, your other jurisdictions do as well. But it's something to think about whether or not you're fully using the tools in the toolbox and whether or not you're taking advantage of the ability to be a development finance agency. So there's all sorts of examples. Economic development authorities, special purpose authorities, local community development authorities, departments of commerce and economic development, business corporations, but on the top there is the one that's probably most likely relevant to you. There's some type of a law in New Mexico where you can be an industrial development authority or industrial development board or redevelopment authority or redevelopment board or development corporation. I don't know what exactly the law is, but look into your laws to make sure that you've got one of these active vehicles by which to access the capital markets. There's 55,000 bond issuers in the U.S. There's thousands of institutions that are involved in this field. And there's hundreds of potential projects that are out there waiting to be financed using the bond market, as we'll talk about here in just one second. 
And this is a landscape of all the tools in the toolbox. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Maybe Joanna will bring me back someday to give my fundamentals presentation, and we can talk about all the tools in our toolbox. So I'll just look at some trends. You know, I'd be curious if we did a poll of how many of you have issued an industrial development bond. Only about 27% of agencies use these frequently, with 50% rarely or never using them. So my guess is half of you have never even done one of these. How about a 501c3 bond? Yeah, that's right. We can issue bonds in the capital markets to support non-for-profits, tax increment finance bonds. You know, 40% of agencies don't use this tool, even though 48 states have this ability to, to use bond financing, revenue bonds, to support redevelopment. And then Aggie bonds. Only 22 states have Aggie bond programs, even though it's legal in all states. Um, what are we doing about financing first-time farmers? So the question becomes, why don't you use these tools, and why is the, is the bond tool in your toolbox a little rusty or a little dusty? Why do we not support uh, the development needs of our community by ignoring while we ignore the oldest tool in the toolbox? Well, first off, you probably don't know about the tool. I mean, sometimes there's sometimes there's just lack of knowledge. You just are unaware of how this tool works and how you can put it in place. The second piece is that this is really complex. The, uh, bond financing is is difficult. It's not as hard as tax credits, say, like new market tax credits. Those are very difficult. But it's in the upper echelon of, of complexity. And when we think about bond financing, there's so many misconceptions and misunderstandings. And that causes sort of locally controlled political environments to be difficult. And then why are we here? Well, there's a lack of dedication to ed education and capacity building. Not too many people go to college to learn about bond financing. I'm guessing that most of you on this call have learned about it or heard about it just in your jobs, just in the in the way you work, in, in the interactions you have in economic development. Me, I've been exposed to bonds for 20 years now, and I understand the ins and outs of how they work, but I'm kind of a rarity, and there's not a ton of folks that have that type of experience at the local level that can really understand how to put the tool, these tools in, in place. And so you take the first step right now, which is to be part of this webinar to learn about how, how bonds are part of the toolbox. So. We look at financing as a spectrum, and bonds are right at the top. They are the basic and the bedrock of public finance. And when we look at bonds, we can do things like government projects, established industry, development and redevelopment. Bonds provide a wide base for the way that we can invest in different types of economic development projects. The other thing to keep in mind is that many people will say that not-for-profits is not economic development, and I could argue all day long with you that that's completely wrong. Libraries, YMCA's, community centers, Goodwills, Salvation Armies, uh, Croc centers, uh, theaters, uh, music halls, all the things that we take for granted in our communities as being so important, those are all 501c3s. And they are economic development because if you place a brand new library in an area that's underserved, you can catalyze economic activity all around that. You also provide ways for people to get job creation and to learn how to read and to get their GED. And it puts them into an, an economic uh, uh, an economic direction that helps to spur greater economic growth in your community. So when we're thinking about finance again, we need to think about the tools. All right, I'm going to move a little faster here because we got to cover bonds. All right, bonds are the bedrock tools. And this is what we're talking about, this space of our development finance spectrum. So here we go. Let's do bonds 101. Bond use dates back well over 100 years with the first uh, with, with, with Tax Reform Act of 1986 shaping today's use. We did have a tax reform bill last year in 2017, which also shaped the way bonds are used, but not nearly as, well, as much as the 86 bill. I bet you didn't know this, but a bond is a loan, and a loan is a promise to pay. And when people ask Toby, why do we call it a bond? Because back in the old days, when the first bonds were issued, bonds were issued in the 1800s or the 1900s. I'm sorry, the 1800s, uh, quite a bit. You might you might see them on TV occasionally. You ever see the bank robber robbing the bank, and they take the paper and say bonds on them? Well, that's what they're robbing. They're robbing the coupons because they could turn those coupons in in a New York bank and get cashed out for the purchase for the value of those bonds. So a bond is a loan. And a loan is a promise to pay. And so a borrower says, I need to borrow a million dollars. I promise to pay it back every year, $100,000 for the next 10 years. And that is the agreement. 
in government, it's no different. We borrow at the local level. We borrow for economic development projects, public projects, and somewhere in between. So units of government, we call them issuers. Now, an issuer can be any type of unit of government, like the DFAs that I mentioned, like a school district. There's many different types of units of government, a port authority, a redevelopment authority, an airport authority, an energy utility authority. We regularly borrow uh, through the tax-exempt bond market by pledging revenues to pay back bonds, loans. So here's an example. Your road, uh, your community wants to do some roads. They need $3 million. They go to the capital markets and they borrow $3 million from investors. Those investors say, how are you going to pay me back? And the government says, I'm going to pay you back with appropriated taxes. So every year I'm going to pay you back with taxes. And that's just a general loan. Those investors buy those bonds and are afforded an exemption from tax, uh, income tax on the interest income on these investments. So that's the whole key. I should have that flashing in like uh, big red letters. So investors, say JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Fidelity, all sorts of different uh, individuals, they buy these bonds. They give your city the $3 million for their road improvements, and they get regular interest payments back from, uh, from the borrower, interest and principal. But what's unique about a bond is that that income that that investor is receiving, that interest income is tax exempt which means they pay no federal or state uh, income tax on that income. That's the only reason the tool works. If the tool wasn't, uh, you know, was taxable, then there'd be less demand for it. So the whole way that a tax exempt bond works is by triggering that investor to want to buy that bond. So there's two kinds of bonds. There's GO bonds, government bonds, tax exempt, used for public projects, roads, bridges, sewers, water systems, city halls, jails, prisons, uh, all sorts of different public schools, all sorts of different types of public improvements. Many, most, I'll say many, not most, cities go out on a big bond, geo bond issuance every two to four years for all of that capital improvement that's taking place. The street lights, fire engines, the police cars, all the things you think about. They go out and they issue a big bond. And in my community, they go out and they do, you know, Four eight hundred million dollars, four hundred to eight hundred million dollars every three or four years to raise money to help finance all the things they need, and they just pledge tax revenues to pay it back. Simple. We're not going to really talk about geo bonds much today, because that's just a pretty traditional. There's about thirteen thousand of those issued every year all over the U.S. It's a multi-trillion-dollar industry. And if any of you want to do a geo bond, go down to your city hall and talk to your uh, talk to your finance director and, and and get the ball rolling on that. But the other side of the equation is something called a private activity bond. Now these are the fun bonds. These are the ones that that we'll all get excited about. They're tax exempt and are utilized for economic development. So what that means is that we can do all sorts of different things that we're not able to do with traditional geo with just geos. So looking at this screen, what do bonds finance? So we look at the first section, roads, bridges, water treatment plants, city halls, prison schools, libraries. Um, there's a mix there, parks, swimming pools. Some of those can be done with general obligation bonds and some can be done with private activity bonds. So what could a private activity bond be done for? How about a YMCA? How about a hospital, a stadium, a theater, uh, perhaps a private recycling plant or solar fields? And then look further down, small manufacturers, first-time farmers, nonprofits, and affordable housing, and much more. So what the difference between a GO and a private activity bond is that the private activity bond is ultimately benefiting a private enterprise, but it's going through a public body, the issuer, to be afforded that tax-exempt status. So really what this is, it's a conduit. It allows a private borrower to access a market that is more affordable than traditional finance. So go way back about 15 minutes ago when I mentioned that manufacturer. So that manufacturer comes to you and she needs $5 million. The bank will give her a 9% interest. But if she goes through you on a conduit basis to issue bonds to raise that capital, then she could get it maybe for six and a quarter or 5.75%. So what you've created is a conduit, a mechanism for her to access affordable capital. 
Now you probably got a million questions and we're gonna to try to get to those here in a second on how some of these work. So let's just talk a little bit about the process. First, the issuer, that's you, identifies a project and determines if it qualifies for tax exempt financing, i.e. this manufacturer wants to spend $5 million to expand her plant, to buy some new equipment, and we look and we say, okay, um, that, that qualifies. The lawyers have told us that all of that purchase qualifies. So we get a bond counsel and we get an underwriter, a bank, to prepare documents, legal opinions, and offering statements, and to price and sell the bonds in the capital market. This is all done behind the scenes. You don't do it. These professionals do it. And guess what? They get paid for it. And they prepare it. They prepare a legal opinion that says, yes, this project qualifies. They prepare offering statements so that they can put this online and offer it to investors like Guggenheim and Fidelity and wealthy individuals who like to buy bonds. And they prepare that sale. The underwriter, that bank, uh, say in this case, it'll be key bank capital markets. They place those bonds out in the market and they sell them to investors, bond buyers, raising cash for the project. So they simply said, the Santa Fe Development Authority is going to issue $5 million of tax exempt industrial development bonds. Please, and we're looking for a rate and a, and a term. If you're interested in this deal, please buy these bonds. And that wealthy investor bought those bonds. The issuer pledges revenues, taxes, fees, appropriations, et cetera, et cetera, to pay back the bond, pay back the bond buyers or pay back the loan. But in my situation, it's not the issuer that's pledging the revenues, it's the borrower. So who is that borrower? The manufacturer. So the issuer and the borrower are not always the same entity. So that manufacturer borrowed the $5 million. They went through the issuer to access the bond market. The issuer raised that $5 million and gave it to the borrower, gave it to the manufacturer. And here's where the beauty of the process takes place. The bond is paid back over the course of time with both regular and principal and interest payments. So that manufacturer, she makes regular payments just like any other loan she's ever made. She pays back that bond investor, that bond buyer. In the middle is a trustee. Bank of New York Mellon is a great example. And they're the fiduciary agent. They go to the manufacturer and say, oh, your bond payment's due this month. Manufacturer pays and the trustee doles it out to the bond buyers and manages the payments and, and ensures that everything is done. So you as the issuer have no responsibility on the management of the, of the payment process. You are simply that conduit. Um, there are scenarios upon which the issuer or the borrower may refinance. We're not gonna talk about that right now. And then that bond buyer, remember that investor, that wealthy person who bought those bonds, they, relief, they receive relief from their federal and state income taxes on the interest earnings on those bonds. And so I guarantee there's someone on the phone right now who's saying, but what happens if that bond goes bad? So what happens if that manufacturer fails? Well, let's think about it. Who's on the hook? The answer is the borrower and the investor. The issuer, you, are out of the picture. It's a conduit bond. You've pledged no repayment. You've guaranteed no repayment. And you simply were a mechanism by which for that borrower to access the capital markets. And so if that manufacturer decides to quit and fails, they notify their trustee and they notify the bond buyers that they have failed. And that is a private loan transaction between those two. And they figure out how to work out uh, the reconciliation or the or the uh, the workout plan, and you as an issuer hold no responsibility for that. Now you don't want that to happen, certainly, and you'll do everything you can to find a a uh, positive ending or to rework the bonds or refinance the debt. But you ultimately have no recourse, and that's the word non recourse conduit bond financing. There's no recourse for anyone to try to collect money from you. And that, and here's the thing, you're going to be like, well, that doesn't seem fair. It's entirely fair. When I buy a stock, let's say I buy some stock in Facebook tomorrow, and then next week Facebook breaks the law and my stock plummets, I bought that stock knowing that there was risk to it. Uh, let's say I buy, buy some stock today in Chipotle, and tomorrow they roll out a really bad menu item and it fails and their stock price drops. Well, I bought that stock and I knew what I was getting into. That was a risk investment. 
bond buyers are the exact same way. Fidelity and Guggenheim and JP Morgan, when they buy those bonds, they know the risk that they're getting into and they're doing their due diligence and they're relying on the underwriters and the councils and the trustees to make sure that everybody is in line and it is an honest program because here is why we call it a bond. In the old days, when the railroad barons and the investors got together to build railroads, they said, how are you going to pay me back? And the railroad baron would say, "My bond, with my honor, my bond is my honor, and I promise to pay you back. And that's how we got the word bond, because my bond is my honor, and my honor is that I will pay you back. And so when you're looking at using these tools, I want you to keep in mind that you have two different ways of using them. The first way is that government, uh, that government bond, that geo bond, and that is where you as a community are going to pledge revenues. But the way that you use these bonds and economic development is on the screen. As a conduit bond issuer, you, the issuer and the borrower are not the same. An issuer can be a borrower, like GOs or full faith and credit bonds, but certain borrowers like nonprofits, first time farmers, hospitals, they can use the authority of an issuer just to access the capital markets, i.e. conduit. Bonds issued on a conduit basis are not backed by the issuer. Conduit bond debt is solely the responsibility of the borrower, and the issuer has no responsibility to pay back the bonds, i.e. non-recourse. And that's how you do economic development using private activity bonds. I kind of made it a little simpler than it really is. It's obviously more complex. But the point is, you've got this tool in your toolbox that you might not be using because maybe you were fearful that you had to pay back that debt. It's not your debt. It's the borrower's debt. Now, let's look at the types of bonds that are involved in uh, my little world of private activity bonds, exempt facility bonds like airports, docks, wharves, mass community facilities. You know, perhaps you've got a private airport or a private, uh, uh, private transit facility or some sort of exempt facility that, want, that you want to use. Uh, you could even potentially uh, do those for energy facilities or uh, waste treatment plants, things that are important, uh, you know, fuel, uh, trash to fuel uh, conversions, qualified redevelopment bonds. How about these? These are, you know, the bonds we use for redevelopment projects where we're going to, we're going to uh, pledge the proceeds, the tax proceeds from that project, like a TIF bond. Qualified 501c3 bonds, bonds to finance projects owned and used by 501c3 organizations, hospitals and non-hospital bonds, schools, senior care living facilities, daycares, all sorts of different types of universities, dormitories apply under the 501c3 category. Yeah, qualified exempt small issue bonds, these are IDBs for manufacturers. So if you have manufacturers that are trying to expand, you may be able to access the capital markets using an IDB, Aggie bonds for first time farmers, and then all sorts of other types of revenue bonds where you have revenue generating projects that you can dedicate a revenue source to the repayment. So that gets me to kind of um, take home item number one. Whenever you think about a potential financing using bonds, the first question you should think of is, what is a potential revenue source? And you might stumble at first, but there are all sorts of types of revenue, of revenue streams, taxes, fees, licenses, uh, pay-as-you-goes, all sorts of types of little fees. A really good example is parking garages. They're really expensive. Well, there's a really good revenue stream from the people that park there. And so you can pro forma that and determine, I could issue bonds, and pay it back over the next 20 years using the payment stream from the park, the folks parking there. And I could even charge an extra five cents per hour as an add-on to make sure that I have a dedicated annuity revenue stream coming in to pay back those bonds. And so think about ways in which you can generate revenue. Maybe that parking garage just happens to sit right next to an apartment or a housing complex. And at night, the tenants can park in there for a fee but during the day they need to get out. And so again, you've created a secondary revenue stream, the nighttime parkers, when you had been thinking about that parking garage as simply a nine to five type of operation. So why do we use bonds? Well, it's an opportunity to invest in projects and businesses to influence their return on investment. It's really critical to understand that component. If I'm a manufacturer, if I'm a developer, if I'm a first time farmer and I need to borrow 
millions of dollars, I want to try to get it at the lowest cost of capital possible. Now, that doesn't mean it's free because that's the misnomer in economic development. Incentives are one thing. This is not an incentive. This is a tax structured access to affordable capital system. And so when we're thinking about that manufacturer and she's borrowing $5 million and the difference between a 6% and 8% loan is hundreds of thousands of dollars of interest payments. It's not small potatoes. It's a significant difference. And you as an economic developer can bring that tool to the table to say to her, hey, I know you're thinking about expanding and you're concerned about your cost of capital at 9% at the bank. Why don't we go look at the bond market and see what we can get you? And as an economic developer, look what you just did. You saved the manufacturer tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be thankful and they're going to invest in their company and stay in your community. These are easier to pr pr promote. Put your bond offerings on your website. Say, hey, we're open for business. Want to do an IDB? Want to do a nonprofit? Uh, Want to do an exempt facility? Want to do housing? We're willing to be involved in conduit bond financing. And I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute. Low cost, secure. It's a it's a great tool for the industry, and you can issue them on a conduit basis. I can't say this enough. The number one misconception in the bond market is that you, the issuer, are on the hook for all these bonds. It's simply not true. And you can find all sorts of ways to do your deals in a conduit manner where the borrower is on the hook and the bond buyer is the one who understands the risk. It's not easy, but that's how you do it. Why does industry like it? I already mentioned this. Lower rates. The tax exempt status of the of, of tax exempt bonds is attractive to bond buyers. So there's always a there's always a, an investment pool out there. Uh, this isn't like going out and trying to raise private equity or to try to uh, get someone on on you know on the hook for a redevelopment project at a low cost source of capital. It's not a grant. So you're not big borrowing steel. There's a whole world of bond buyers a established market all over the world, quite frankly, uh, that are interested in this. And it's cheaper money, but it's not free money. And if you've ever met me or if you ever do meet me, you'll know one thing. I'm not a big fan of 0% of interest loans and tax abatements. I think we should finance things, not give away things. So important players, issuers. We talked about this. There's 55,000 bond issuers throughout the company. You must have a country. Uh, you must have authority to issue bonds. Go find out tomorrow. If you're uncertain, T. Rittner at CDFA.net. I could tell you in three minutes whether or not you're, uh, you're a qualified issuer. Uh, give Joanna a call. Give New Mexico Finance Authority a call. Get a hold of your, your, your council and government there, and they'll, they'll let you know the pathway to finding an issuer. Bond Council. These are folks that provide a legal public finance opinion underwriters they sell or place the bonds in the market trustees fiduciary agent for the bondholders investors those who purchase the bonds financial advisors independent reviewers for the issuers and rating agencies which is also important perhaps you want to get the deal rated so you get a better rate on your uh, invest on your uh, better rate uh, interest rate on your on your issuance a couple of notes <clears throat> market forces are at play so you might remember um, 2010, 11, 12, 13, uh, you know, uh, President Obama was not interested in raising interest rates, and that was their fiscal policy. So traditional interest rates were low. So in my scenario, that manufacturer would go and borrow, and maybe she'd get that $5 million loan for seven and a quarter, and then the bond market was 7.15. Well, when that's the case, it's probably just as easy for her to go and do the traditional loan and not go through the public bond issuance process. But look now, interest rates are creeping up. <coughs> President Trump has uh, his fiscal policy is to widen that gap a little bit, which lots of presidents go back and forth. It's not a political commentary. It just is what it is. So when that happens, people are interested in bonds. Why? Because they go back to that more affordable market. So that spread between traditional I'm sorry, that spread between uh, interest rates, traditional and tax exempt, is a real key factor into how the market will accept your deal. You need good bond counsel on transactions. Don't risk an issuance going taxable if it's not a qualified private activity bond. Here's a really good example. Don't buy anything. We get all these organizations and 
that manufacturer, she goes out and she buys $2 million worth of the equipment already. Well, she just blew it because you can't go back in time. So you want to make sure that you get good counsel who says, here's the steps in the process. Don't, uh, don't jump the gun. The other thing is during a bond transaction, you know, you got a building period. Let's say you're going to build a YMCA or a community center or something. And during that, something happens that triggers that the project is no longer a private, is no longer qualified for tax exempt bonds. Well, you really screwed up. Someone's probably going to get fired. But what you want is to have that bond council up at the beginning saying, here are things you cannot do. I'm watching every step so that we don't get into a situation where we go taxable. And then the last thing is lots and lots of rules and regulations. Learn the programs before making any determinations. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. I'm not that old, but I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. It is complex and hard. A, a one hour webinar is not even remotely close to any, any type of, uh, of technical expertise to go out and do this. We offer, shameless plug, we offer a full two day intro course, a full two day advanced course. And in the interest of full disclosure, most people take our intro bond course twice because it's difficult. But you just have to know the rules and the regulations and then you're gonna be set. So let's see, what do we got? I'm trying to get this to move. I think I'm frozen, one second. All right, so a couple of examples, 501c3 bonds. In Alaska, the Alaska Industrial and Export Authority, a great organization, a member of CDFA, they issued bond for the Yukon, I'm not saying that, Cusco Quinn Health Corporation for a healthcare center. Now, that's 161 million, that's a big one, obviously. But you think about healthcare in Alaska, pretty important for, uh, for those people. You want something smaller? Here in Ohio, the Development Finance Authority of Summit County issued 8.9 million for the Lawrence School for a new campus for that uh, private school or for that, uh, that school in that community. Over in Illinois, this is pretty neat, the Illinois Finance Authority issued $13 million for the Big Ten Conference's headquarters and conference space in Rosemont. I've uh, seen the presentation on this one. It's amazing. The Big Ten Conference is a 501c3. So think about economic development, right? A uh, big, huge opportunity to bring in the headquarters of the Big Ten Conference. And it's just a $13 million deal. It wasn't some giant, ginormous uh, project, but it really helped Rosemont uh, with economic development. Industrial development bonds, going back to Illinois. Illinois Finance Authority issued $3.9 million for a CNL tile, tile company for construction equipment of a $3,000 manufacturing, manufacturing facility. Again, not, I mean, not a huge project, right? $3.9 million for a manufacturer saving jobs and helping them uh, grow as a company. In Texas, the Mission Economic Development Corporation in Seguin issued uh, $6.8 million for a concrete culvert manufacturing facility. And equipment. So again, these aren't like super sexy projects. Concrete culvert manufacturing facility sounds pretty normal, everyday economic development. I bet many of you are looking at these kinds of projects. Like in California, 2.25 million to rehab a building for an expanding food manufacturer. And that was issued by the city of Los Angeles's Industrial Development Authority. So sometimes I get the question like, well, Toby, our projects aren't big enough. Well, you know, 2.25 million is probably the smallest, maybe you can go 2 million, but lots of manufacturers have capital needs between two and 8 million, two and $10 million. And that's the sweet spot of the industrial development bond. So don't close the door on a, on a potential project before you start looking at whether or not it could potentially qualify. And then just kind of for fun, you know, waste to energy, 6.7 million for a landfill development project uh, in 12 counties in Texas and they're converting waste to energy. So maybe you have some projects going on there where you're trying to take waste, you're trying to take some biofuel and uh, biomass and turn it into fuel. Maybe you wanna do uh, solar panels or you wanna do wind turbines. I mean, New Mexico certainly has a lot of sun and you wanna be able to invest in that, you can issue bonds, whether they're private activity or geo to support that. There's a small little city here in Ohio called Minster, Ohio. It's going to change the landscape of community solar forever. This small little teeny village issued bonds to support its its uh, community solar uh, panel, solar array. It now powers its city 
with solar panels, little teeny Minster, Ohio. People thought they were crazy, but they used bond financing to support the tool, a long-term investment. Ports and docks and facilities, you know, four, 49 million in revenue bonds for the port improvement projects at the San Diego Unified Port District. Again, you might have a port in your community, an airport, a dock, a wharf, somewhere where mass commuting comes into to play. Senior living, and we don't, you know, cover a lot of housing at CDFA. We do have a new housing course coming online in November, but right here's a really good example. 21 million for Presbyterian communities in South Carolina, issued by the South Carolina JADA to add um, Laurel Crest and West Columbia to its family of senior living and care centers. So sometimes senior living centers buy other ones up. Well, they can issue bonds to make that purchase happen to allow for that center to expand. And again, you may not call that economic development, but our population is aging and we need a place for these people to transition to uh, as they age and developing senior living facilities is, is really critical right now. So some best practices as I wrap up here, this is just a list of great, great places that do it. Uh, some big cities, some small places. Um, and I just, these are just some screenshots. They're not all that useful, but, you know, look at Business Oregon. You go to their website and it says, you know, finance programs. And then you go to their finance page and I circled them all in, in red. Look, industrial development bonds, Aggie bonds. So maybe you say, well, that's Oregon. What about somewhere closer? Okay, Colorado. Go to their website and you click on their business lending and right there, tax exempt bonds for manufacturers and nonprofits, open for business. See, this doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to create reams of paperwork and procedure. You just can create a couple of web pages that say, hey, we do this and we're active. Um, place that I hold near and dear, Toledo, Lucas, Toledo, Ohio, where my entire family is from. You go to their website. So this is a development finance authority. In Ohio, we call them port authorities. And you go to their website and right there, fixed interest rate revenue bonds, conduit revenue bonds, infrastructure financing. That's all bond financing. It's their core of what they do. And if I had to pick a bond financing agency in the US that you should emulate, I would say the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority is pretty awesome. And then you start saying, well, that's scale. Have you ever been to Toledo? It's, uh, it's a pretty rough place and they are doing amazing work with their small little city to revitalize and redevelopment their old uh, Rust Belt community. St. Louis, you go to their business finance pages and you'll find right away tax exempt loans and bonds is one of the first things that they promote. In fact, uh, St. Louis Economic Development Partnership was one of the first to launch a mini bond program to allow for quicker access. On a smaller community, Chester County in Pennsylvania, you know, finance your business. And what's the first thing on their list? Tax exempt financing and ag financing, Aggie bonds. And so they have, you know, infused the bond tool into their economic development strategy. And then these are hard to see, but you know, the city of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Economic Development Corporation teaming up together to provide resources for bond financing. And then in case you were wondering, Eric's gonna say to me, well, we don't do this in New Mexico. Well, I just uh, really quickly screenshot the uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico city website and look, under their business incentives, industrial revenue bonds. So at least Albuquerque's in the business and so is Santa Fe. And so right here, two cities that are in your, you know, in your state that have programs in place where they're trying to help community, help companies uh, put in place resources for uh, bond financing resources. Uh, I wanna say thank you. Just a couple more notes before I leave. If, I, I meant to put it on here. This is That's why there's a big white screen. I forgot to put it in there. If you go to cdfa.net and you click on our resource centers, there's everything you want to know about bonds. You will not find a resource bigger in the world, but it's overwhelming and it can be alarming the amount of information. So if you want to learn more about bonds, listen to webinars like this, take some training and get a hold of some counsel and some experts. And I'm happy to introduce you to those people. We're here as a resource. We're a mission-driven organization whose job is to serve uh, remove barriers to access to capital for economic development. Uh, with that, Joanna, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, everybody, for being such a tentative audience, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Toby. That was great. Um, let me see if we've got any questions here. And I'll read you the questions. Um, so, 
Um, are courses only available to CDFA members? Oh, heavens no. We uh, have member and non-member rates. We want anyone and everybody to participate in our in our events. So you, it's open to everybody. Just register either as a member or a non-member. I would tell you right now, you should just join because you're wasting money paying the non-member rates. One course saves you the money. So join and get the resources and then also get the course. But no heavens, no, everybody's involved in the courses, invited to the courses. Okay. Next question is, are IDBs the same or similar to IRBs? <laughs> I love that question. Thank you. That cracks me up. They're the same thing. So it just depends. Um, bond terms are regional in nature. It tend to come from what the neighbor next door called them. And they're called, so industrial development bonds are called small issue manufacturing bonds, manufacturing bonds, qualified small issue bonds, industrial revenue bonds, industrial development bonds. They all have, different, there's all sorts of names. They're all the same thing. I wish, I wish people would just call them the same name, but we tend to change things regionally here in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> Next question is, how do these bonds work with anti-donation laws? Anti-donation laws? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. Well, <laughs> um, this is a question by um, Brett Weir, and he probably is referencing in our state statute we have an anti-donation clause that doesn't allow us to invest directly into a company. Um, specifically, oh, yeah. talking about our yeah, closing yeah. fund, we we can't invest in the company. We have to give um, that grant money to a fiscal agent, which then invests. In so no no impact on that. This is a federal imp federal implement provided to the states. The states every state has already said yes, it's legal. In my state, every state has, and there's no you're not you're not donating anything, you're not paying anything, you're not investing anything as the issuer on a conduit basis. It is, you're simply a pass-through. You have no ownership, no stake, you're simply passing through an exemption. So um, there's no there's no issues with that. And we have heard that before. There are other states that have those challenges. I just hadn't heard the term donation laws, um, but you have no concern about that. Okay, great. And then um, next question is, do all bonds require a pledge stated revenue stream prior to issuance? Well, I mean, technically, yes, but if it's a GO bond, if it's like your city is going to issue bonds for roads or bridges or sewers, you're going to absolutely pledge taxes. You don't have a choice. Taxes are fees, right? If it's a water system, you're going to pledge fees. So, yes, there are virtually no unsecured bond transactions unless you're like you know the state of the state of california you you're good for it kind of thing but there does have to be a secured line of repayment now on a private activity bond the repayment is simply a loan payment from the company so the company's not saying let's go let's go back to my manufacturer she's going to do a five million dollar um, plant expansion. She's not saying from the sales that I make, I will pay it back. She's saying I will pay it back. So yes, you do have to have a pledged repayment stream, but it can be different for different types of projects. Okay. Um, and then a uh, follow-up question, what if the bond is simply for a property tax abatement? What if the bond is for a property tax abatement? I guess I don't I don't have enough details on that. What does that okay. mean? Okay. We can we can follow up with with Jamie. And then um there was a question about how does CDFA keep the online resource database updated? <laughs> well, I have a team of 12 people here, and three of them are dedicated to that piece of subject matter. So they do their best to go through and update it and put stuff in there every day. Um, we're about due for a refresh. We've been putting stuff in the database for about 14 years now, and it's got a lot of stuff in there. So if you see anything that's old and you want to give us a new file, please send it our way. Okay, great. 
I think that concludes the questions. And um, feel free if you if you think of questions um, that come up if you if you're listening to this webinar and presentation later after the fact, feel free to email me. I can get that over to to Toby if if needed. And just want to reiterate um, the wonderful, amazing resource that CDSA is. I use it very frequently. Um, going to that resource database and um, can find articles and, and webinars. It's, it's really informative and, and helpful. Um, really quick before we jump off, um, we do have some upcoming events. The next webinar that we're going to have is um, we will be uh, hearing from the USDA. Uh, Richard Kerrig and, and his team will be doing an overview of the USDA funding programs that are available for economic development and infrastructure projects. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, July 26th, um, and then all of these links are live. You can click on them and immediately register. Our Rural Efficient Business Program workshop will be coming up in Clovis, August 7th. The, the next one will be in Carlsbad in November, too, so just a heads up. Our funded meeting is coming up September 4th. That will be in Santa Fe at the North Central Economic Development District uh, office. And you have until August 24th to apply, and this is um, applications that if you have an economic development project or infrastructure project in your area and you need help, um, navigating funding sources, you can apply for that um, meeting and present. And then just want to point out again that we are actively enrolling lenders and projects in the credit enhancement program, so um, would encourage you to find more information uh, or enroll at, at our link. And um, if you need to contact uh, the finance team, Juan Torres, uh, finance team leader, and then myself, you can go to our, our uh, web page or our um, department web page as well. So with that, that concludes our, our webinar and just want to extend a, a huge amount of gratitude to Toby. This was really insightful, really informative. So thank you so You're much, welcome. Toby. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still really excited about it. So um, I hope that everybody's able to take this information and um, take it back to their communities and, and reach out to our team or to CDSA. But thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay, you too. Goodbye. Bye.